Queridos irmãos, queridas irmãs em Cristo. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are very welcome to another transmission from the Life for All Institute. We are in the meeting hall of the church of the churches of the Pará region with Pará, Maranhão and Piauí in the city of Castanhal. We are very happy here. It is such a feast. I don't even know how to describe. The Lord have, has filled us with joy and hope of bringing Him back. This is what truly matters. And we are now entering a series of four messages that are going to compose a book of four chapters. And the temporary title of this book is Army, Tabernacle and Good Land. The first message that we are going to see today has by title Multiplication and Dominion. And the scripture reading is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. I wanted to show to you from where this this message came. It was in the meeting of captains and troops a few weeks ago, where many of these captains that are taking care of our teenagers gave testimonies, and we had a wonderful fellowship, and the Lord gave us a special light on that occasion. So, once more I wanted to tell you that the word that God's word truly does not come from men, because we are not prepared to say any of this. But the Lord gave us a word, a light, and a direction. And the light was so strong that we are going to transform this in messages and after in a book. I'm going to read what I have prepared here. During the meeting of captains of troops in Sao Paulo, the Lord showed us a very strong light in His Word that broadened our vision in serving Him. Because God has risen a multitude of teenagers who love His Word and are obedient to his orders, praying for people in the streets and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they form the troops of God's army without fear, redeeming people from the streets, from the empire of darkness, to introduce them in the kingdom of God. These troops need command. The Lord prepared more mature young people to lead them in the direction of the Spirit. The Lord needs this army to introduce His kingdom and to introduce people to the kingdom of the heavens. We are here to put Christ in the throne of the kingdom of the heavens. Let us read Psalms a hundred and ten. Verse one The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Our Lord Jesus after he died for us and poured his blood at the cross. He was 
by God's power, resurrected from the dead. And this is in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power, and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So our Lord died so that He could make our redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, and we were bought back for God. But God also resurrected him from the dead and elevated him to the heavens and he was put at the right hand, seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. And this heavenly place is far above any authority, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named. So our Lord is seated at the right hand of God until God put all things under His feet. Now let us go back to Psalms 110, to the second verse. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. So God wants to put all Christ's enemies under his feet. But how he is going to do this? He was, he was going to send out of Zion the rod of your strength. In other words, Zion is the strong part of the church. Zion is where, the, is where David conquered and called the stronghold of Zion. It is a part of Jerusalem that defends the city of God. And we are here now to introduce the King of Zion and Jerusalem. So God's going to use not all the church, but Zion, the strong part of the church, to put all Christ's enemies under his feet. And for that, God needs an army. That's why it says in the third verse, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. In, other, in another version, it says that your people will present themselves generously in the day of your calling. But God provided more things. Not only the people of the church will be volunteers, But in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you will have your army 
of holy youth. So it is based in this verse that we realized in 2020 that the coming of God of the Lord was near. And also that the dawn had begun. What is dawn? It is the beginning of the day. But not many people can see the very beginning. But from the word that God gave us, gave us in 2020, we saw that the dawn was beginning. And now God truly have gave us, have given us this dew that started to rise as our teenagers, our young people, and our children. And we are now truly forming a great army. So, on one hand, God needs an army to make Christ King. But in another hand, Christ was anointed to another task. You can remember in Matthew 16, verse 18, Christ says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. If I read verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So he is the Christ. He was anointed by God to do God's work. That is, building up the church. So the task of Christ is to build up the church. And he said, I personally will build up the church. That's why God put me in the heavenly places that we just saw. Let us go back to Ephesians 1, verse 20. I've read 20 and 21, but in verse 22, we see, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. So Christ was given by God to the church. To what? To become the head over all things. And the church is his body, the fullness of him who feels all in all. That's why God needs the cooperation of the church to do His will. Verse 9 says, Having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. But how is he going to do this? He's going to do this through the church. So the church is the body of Christ, and by him being the head over the church, 
Christ is going to fill his church with the elements of God's truth, then Christ will be filled with the reality of Christ through the Word, so that the church can be the fullness So the way that God can make Christ be the head over all things is to fill you with Christ, with the reality of Christ and with the Word. We can see here the importance of the immersion in the Word, of inculcating the Word in our hearts. And so the church needs to fulfill this mission that Christ gave to them. And this is in Matthew 21, in Matthew 28, the last three verses. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth because he has the mission to be the head over all things from heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does this mean to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all the nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This means that we are going to preach the gospel, and this gospel is going to, through the baptism, when the person believes in the Lord Jesus, is going to make them a member of the body of Christ. We are not only enrolled in an institution, in a religious institution. No, when we were baptized by the Spirit, He made us part of the body of Christ. That's why our mission is for people to be baptized into the body of Christ as members of the body of Christ. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. So God put Christ at his right hand in the heavenly places, but at the same time, when the church fulfills his, its mission, baptizing people and preaching the gospel, and we, we teach these people, we perfect these people to the building up of the church, Christ that is seated in the heavens is with us. Our Lord Jesus is with us when we preach the gospel in the streets, when we pray for people in the streets, Christ is with us. He promised, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Now I'm going to go back to Genesis, verse 1, chapter 1, to show that God, when He created man, He already has had this purpose in His heart. What is the purpose of God in the creation for man? is multiplication and dominion, these two things. I'm going to read verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. We can realize here that when God created man, He gave him a twofold mission. That we can see in verse 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So the twofold mission that God gave men was to be fruitful and multiply. On one hand, to be fruitful refers to the natural reproduction of the human being. But through spiritual eyes, this is saying here that man needs to be fruitful in the life of God. When God created man, he took him to the middle of the garden, and there was the tree of life. And God's desire was for man who was created in his likeness and image, was for man to go to this tree, eat from this tree, receiving the life of God, and then the man would be fruitful. The life of God would enter man in his spirit and he would be fruitful. In him, by multiplying in the human life, the life of God would also be multiplied. Do you understand? This is the way God wants to fill the earth, to have dominion over it. It's to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and filling the earth is to occupy the spaces. For what? To govern by God. So it's two things. This is multiplication and dominion. All these four messages are going to have this as the main line. Oh Lord Jesus. So this is the hope that God had when he created man. But you know that man fell right in chapter 3. I don't want to give much detail in this. But the serpent distracted Eve putting doubt in the word of God and their mind was corrupted. And they fell on the trap of the devil. And you know that Eve ended up eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And not only he ate, she ate, but she gave it to Adam to eat it as well. And then what happened? Let us see in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the word, world, and death through sin, and thus death is spread to all men because all sinned. 
because of this deceiving man became disconnected from God because sin entered the world and then death entered and death spread to all mankind. Every man was created with the purpose of multiply and dominate the earth for God, but he lost their, he, they lost this function. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So, this is very sad, because everyone is under the empire of death. And we can see that Already at the age of Noah, in Genesis 6, man became enslaved in the empire of darkness, in the reign of death. So, in verse 11 of chapter 6, the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. So, mankind lost its function, and all this generation of Noah was killed because of the excessive violence and excessive sin, and from this moment, it seems like that there was a new hope, but sin was in men, and death reigned over men. And from this moment, I'm not going to even detail the story, but the generation of men started to be deceived by the dominion of darkness. Nimrod started to be king saying that we don't need God, we can live without God, starting to defend a civilization without God. Man can take care of himself, but men need some kind of help from a certain divinity, and then they created the idols. So then, all the earth created by God and man who was created by God to multiply, receiving the life of God from the tree of life, not only did man lose this function, but he also spread the adoration of idols through all nations. And all nation, all the earth was filled with pagan nations that adored idols. If I ended the message here, God wouldn't have any more hope because all the earth was corrupted. But thank God he did not give up on men. In the midst of all this situation, God called one man. We can see in Genesis 12,
in verse 1. Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I'm going to give you a land. Verse 2, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in the midst of all of this earth, filled with pagan nations, God called one man to make so that his will can be done again. This is well, how God started again to seek out the fulfilling of His will. So this is related to the earth. Verse 5, Then Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. Abram arrived at the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land of the place. of Shechem, as far as the Terebinth tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were then in the land. So this land was occupied, and you know that no man gives land for free. So the kings and kingdoms fought themselves at that time for land. Verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. I'm going to repeat it. To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So God promised to give him the land of Canaan. God promised to give Abram the land, but He not gave Abram the possession yet, because this land needs to be conquered. That's why God needs an army. And then what happened? Verse 13. Abram went out with his wife and he took his nephew Lot with him. But Lot did, wanted an independent life. He wanted to have his cattle apart from Abram's cattle. This was, was very foolish. If Lot had said, since Abram and Sarai adopted him, me as a son, I'm going to be the son of Abram. I don't need another structure of my own. Because at that time, you would need two different structures to take care of the cattle. But two structures wouldn't be 
uh, wouldn't fit in the same land. And then Lot said, you choose a side and I'm going to the other side. So he departed from Abram and then he lost the blessing. What was the end of Lot? His wife become, became a statue of salt. His city was burnt and also he ended up having incestuous relations with his daughter. That's why, saints, we must go to where the Lord is commanding us to go. If He commanded us to go and follow Abram, let us follow Abram. And then after Abram departed from Lot, the Lord appeared to him again. And then Lord said to Abram, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also can be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of memory, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. So I'm not going to detail the story from now on, because after Abraham came Isaac and Jacob, and then Joseph, and after Joseph, the people of, is of, of Abram the, lived in Egypt because of, of the of the famine but after a while the people of Israel became slaves in the land of Egypt and this represents our story because God called these people from the Egypt and Egypt represents Pharaoh in this world and although we need the world to survive our job is there our survival is there but we do not belong to the world we belong to the Lord. We were bought by His blood. We belong to the Lord. Then, Lord took the people out of Israel and then He opened His heart when they arrived.
and Mount S Sinai. And we can see this uh, in Exodus 19, verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. It, it is not a religion. I want for my people to come to me very close. God does not want a religious thing. He wants an organic things, a people that is close to Him. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. God could say this, all the earth is mine. But in the reality, the earth was filled with pagan nations. That's why he needed a different nation that would be his. That's why he says, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. This means that there is a way for the will of God to be fulfilled. It is true through the word. That's why we need to hear the word of God like these teenagers here who are taking notes. They are obedient to the, this word that they are hearing. And this is the way for us to be close to God. God wants you very close to Him. Not for you to be a religious person. He wants you close to Him. He wants you close to Him. And how can you be this close, even to understand His heart? It is through the Word. And the Word cannot be something dead. It is something rich that is going to make you love the Lord more. So that's what the Lord wants, to create an organic people of, that is his property. So God was saying here, all the earth is mine, but I don't have a people that is my possession. That's why he's saying this here in verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Everyone is a priest and holy. God wants people that have His nature, His holy nature. God wants that everyone in this kingdom serve Him, to serve Him. That's why today all members now in the church must function. We are members of the body of Christ. You're not going to say, I need a pastor that is going to make the things for God for me and I will travel and take care of my life. It is not like this. God 
wants you to make and to build up his body for you to be a living member that serves him. And in this way, we will have the edification of the church. I'm going to show to you what God desires, that is multiplication and dominion. But I'm going to I'm going to start in a very unusual place, that is the feeding of the 5,000. What did this, this, the, what did the lad have to make, to fulfill the will of God? He had five loaves and two fishes. What did God do with five loaves? He multiplied it. So you can see here the multiplication. The loaves, the bread, come from plant life. That come from wet wheat. And this plant life represents what? All the grains, cereals, With all of them, the same miracle happens. All farmers plant one grain on the earth. That's in this grain that they plant on on the on the earth grows and multiplies it so the grain represents the multiplication of life in Matthew 13 God wants to take us back to the tree of life. So we need the land to have the multiplication. God put man on earth in order for him to multiply. So the, the grain needs the earth to multiply. Let us go first, actually, to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. That's why the five bread of that lad represents the plant life in which God wants to multiply the life of God. Christ had the life of God and he was put on earth. But if he was not willing to die, he was going to die without producing anything. But he was willing to die in this death at the cross. We produced and multiplied in all of us. So the plant life represents the multiplication of grain. What does God truly really want to do? 
Then we could go to Matthew 13. Verse, verse 3 says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. So this seed is this grain of wheat, that God wants to multiply. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. And then verse 8, But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then, verse 10, And then the disciples came to and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. That's why, saints, he who accompanies closely the prophetic word, God gives revelation. And what is this mysteries? Verse 18. Therefore, I hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. And we can extract two things here. First, that the seed who was sown there it is the word of the kingdom. The word that God has been speaking to us, it is the word of the kingdom that is going to produce the kingdom. And when it says here that this seed, this word, fell on the earth, it says here, what was sown in his heart. So it says here that the word is sown into the hearts of men. Verse 23, But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. If we have a heart that is not barren, a heart that believes, that is simple, like our teenagers, then when the word enters in their heart, the word bears fruit and starts to grow. Then God wants For men to multiply this seed, we need to multiply and fill the earth. And this is not only physical land, the land is the heart of man. Why do we go to the streets to preach the gospel of the kingdom? Because the land is there. The land is the people. When we approach someone saying, May I pray for you? His heart or her heart 
It is the land. And when we give and we pray for them and we let books with them, we are doing this to win over the hearts of the people. That's why it says in Matthew 24, 14, in this gospel, all the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. So the land that we must conquer for the Lord, it is an inhabited land. That's why we need to go where people are. The Lord wants the heart of man for you to preach the gospel of the kingdom, sowing these seeds in, these seeds in the heart of man. God wants you to multiply, to be fruitful, and this multiplication will happen. That's why I introduced the need to build up the tabernacle that is the place for God's dwelling with men. The seed of the kingdom that we are sowing in the in people is in order for God to have a tabernacle here on earth. That's why in John chapter 1 verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And in John 3, he says, Everyone must be born again. And needs to be guided by the Spirit. So what God is doing is making us members of the body of Christ. Romans 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, be, so we being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So this grain of wheat that died and produce many grains. We are not these many grains loose. This grain that died wants to produce a body. And this body is the tabernacle. And so God has a dwelling place on earth with men. This is what God wants to do. We can see this in 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. God sowed 
a seed of the kingdom in us and made us members of just one body. And this body must be edified and built up. And this body is the tabernacle that God wanted for the people of Israel to build in the desert. Now, let us go to Ephesians 4. Verse 11. And he himself... I'm going to read what I wrote. God does not want individual isolated Christians. That's why he put us in the body to function as members. That's why he gave to the body some as prophets, some as pastors and masters to perfect the saints to the work of the ministry. What is our work? Is the building up of the body of Christ. I don't think you are understanding quite well yet, but God wants a building, an edification, and this comes through the body, through the members of the body of Christ. And God put in this, man, in this body prophets, masters, evangelists to perfect you into this ministry to build up the body of Christ. And in verse 13 we see till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God wants his objective, his goal is for us to reach the maximum level of the stature of Christ, of the fullness of Christ. And how does one do this? Through the Word. Oh Lord Jesus, I have a difficult task to explain you this. How is God able to edify for Christ to be the head over all things? For him to govern our lives. What is the best way for this? What is the best way? It is not. You can know all of these things, but don't have the reality of this. So the best, the best way is for him to fill you with Christ. We cannot run away from the book of Ephesians because it shows all the design of God, of what he wants to do with man and the church. Chapter 3 of Ephesians 17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. What is the way for Christ to be the head in your life? And also, by default, over all the members, of his church. How is he able to do this? He can do this by putting Christ in your heart. 
It is not only in your heart. Christ must dwell in your heart. In this dwelling here, is not as a guest. He wants to be the owner of your heart. So your mind and emotion must allow Christ to be the owner. You still think many natural things, but He wants, He wishes to fill you, your mind, with Christ. Your emotions, our emotions, are very fragile. We have fragile emotions. How can God resolve this? Filling us with Christ, making Christ the owner of my emotions. How can Christ be how can be my will? Can fill my will. But how is he able to do this? That Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you've been rooted and grounded in love. You see that the foundation here is love, and we sang a song here that says that we are being connected and binded together in love. So when Christ comes, and starts to dwell in my mind, my emotion, my will. And this dwelling builds a foundation, a ground of love. Let us continue. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. And we start to understand the size of Christ. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. You start to have the notion of knowing the love of Christ. For what? That you may be able, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There's only one way for God to make Christ the head in your life. It is to fill you with Christ. Putting you in the body with all the saints so that you can understand the size of Christ. And all of this has a goal. The goal for you to be filled until the fullness with Christ. He wants to fill you with Christ. But this is still doctrine. How is He going to fill, you, fill me with Christ? We, we can see how in the fifth chapter, verse 18, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So, to be filled with Christ is to be filled with the Spirit. And how am I going to be filled with the Spirit? Is speaking to one another. This is the immersion. It's transcription. It's to inculcate the Word in your hearts. That's why the way, the path that the co-porters and teenagers took in immersion is the right path. We are, by doing this, we are being filled with Christ and being edified and edifying the body of Christ. We are reaching the unity of faith and the result in chapter 4 
né? Chega no versículo 15, mas seguindo a verdade em amor, cresçamos em tudo naquele que é a cabeça. In verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. All the members are going to grow into him, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I'm referring to multiplication and the edification of, of the tabernacle. That, so that God can have this fabric of love. God is knitting together this fabric of love. You that are serving the teenagers, don't you realize that God is knitting you together in a fabric of love? This is the edification of the church, the building up of the church, and the multiplication of life. Because God is earning more people, gaining more people to Him. It's very hard to explain this, but this is what's happening. And you can see this in Col Colossians. Three, sixteen. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, because by inculcating the word in us, this reality of the edification is going to happen among us. Love is the only thing that can unite us all. It is God's love that is the only thing that it is able to unite us together and to knit this fabric of love. In Colossians 2, verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches. So, the edification must result in a fabric of love. I'm making ground here to, for the other churches so that I can speak about the tabernacle. Then you may be able to understand. So the edification, what God wants to do, we can see in Matthew 1, verse 23. The name of Christ gives us the idea of God, what God wants to do. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So the tabernacle that God wants us to build in the desert, it is the dwelling place of God with us. And in John chapter 15, we, what do we see? We see the figure of the true wine. This is a figure of the tabernacle. I am the true wine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, 
In every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that he may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me he can do nothing. So Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. The branches and the vine are the same thing. And God is the vine dresser that takes care of this vine. God wants this organic entity, not an, a religious institution. And then, when we arrive in John 17, verse 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the word may believe that you sent me. What is the purpose for God doing all of this with us? So that we can be one, just as the Father is one with the, the Son. They are already one, but they want to introduce us in this unity. And this is what's happening with us. Teenagers' house, preaching the gospel, immersion in the Word, what is happening? We are being introduced into God. We are being more one among us and with God. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. The work of an education is so that we can be one with God. And we can see in Revelations 21 verse 3 And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. If you look in another version of the Bible, you can see in God and He, God with them will be their God. We will be part we will be inserted in God. God in the future is not only will not only be God, He is going to be God with men. So the reality of the tabernacle comes in today we build up the church of God. I'm going to speak I'm going to speak now of the two fishes. I spoke about the five loaves. I'm going to speak now about the two fishes. The two fishes are related to testimony and dominion. Fish comes from the animal life. The animal life is connected to redemption. Christ needed to pour his blood to redeem us, to redeem us. And redemption is for what? It's for the minion. It's for the kingdom. God bought us so that he can have a kingdom and dominion on earth. The best verse for us to understand this is Revelations chapter 5. 
verse 9 and 10. And we're going to understand that the two fishes are for redemption and the redemption are for dominion. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God. This is referring to the animal life. Because Christ poured his blood. Because when we need redemption, we need blood. And blood comes from the animal life. From the plant life, we see the multiplication. And from the animal life, we see redemption. Because redemption indicates that sin entered man. Indicates that God lost man to another kingdom. So sin entered the world, death entered the world, and death went into everyone. So redemption aims to take the people out of this other empire and introduce them in the empire of God. And you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. So God redeems us with his blood to make us kings and priests that will reign on the earth. This is why there's two fish here. So man lost his function in the fall by disobeying God, making the death and sin enter the world. But all things were created by God and all land is his but he, he not, did not have a nation of his property. That's why he called the people of Israel to be a reign of priests and a holy nation. So God needed to redeem to him a people to constitute his kingdom. And we can see this in 1 Peter 1.18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Verse 9 of the second chapter says, But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That's why the prayer that that Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The problem here is for the will of God to be done. And God losing man 
to the sin and to Satan. But now with the blood, he can buy back his people and he wants to make his kingdom here on earth and to establish his kingdom and his sovereign on earth. That's why, after all these things, Paul speaks about fighting for the kingdom of God in Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore I take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So, against the build-up church, the gates of hell will not withstand. That's why God needs to make this fabric of love in order for us to have the reality of God and to fight for the kingdom of God. Then we will bring Him back. And when our struggle is finished, we are going to introduce the kingdom of God. And Christ is going to reign with the overcomers for a thousand years. And in the end of this millennium, he's going to make another rebellion. After Christ, is king for a thousand years, Satan will still make a rebellion. And then Christ will be able to sweep away and clean everything. As we can see in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 23 says, But each one is his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when the, he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, the church is this army formed by these teenagers and captains, all the churches that is going to defeat Satan. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be, be destroyed is death. We are going to defeat death now, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. That is, God the Father is not subjected to Christ. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. When this happens, what is going to happen? The dispensation of time will end. We won't need time anymore. Time exists so that can Christ can be the king. When Christ delivers the 
kingdom to the Father because everything was destroyed, Satan, death, and everything. There won't be any more enemies. Everything will be under Christ, under God. And we won't need time anymore. And all of us will be introduced in eternity. We won't be limited by time anymore. We won't live in this material body. We will be in this spiritual body. And for all eternity, we'll be priests of God and we'll be together with the Lord, reigning with Him forever. Jesus is the Lord.